clearly you've got an intelligence uh, involved with the phenomenon. And it seems apparent to me uh, that one of the items on their agenda in terms of their interaction at this point in human history is quite clearly connected to nuclear weapons. America Audio with your host, Tim Benall. Hello out there, my friends. This is Tim Benall of BenallofAmerica.com with another edition of BOA Audio Season 2. It is June 16th, 2007. This week, our guest is Robert Hastings. He's going to be talking about the UFO nuke connection. Anyone who has more than just a peripheral knowledge of the UFO phenomenon knows that there is a certain strange trend that has shown itself over the years with regards to UFO sightings, and that is UFO sightings over nuclear missile bases. Well, Robert Hastings has spent the last 30 years cultivating and investigating these very cases. He's going to bring his lofty research here to the program in this interview and share with us his take on this strange subsection of ufology. We're going to find out about his background, how he decided to focus on the UFO new connection, key cases like the Maelstrom Air Force Base case of 1967 and the Big Sur case of 1964. Also, cases involving various levels of UFOs tampering with nuclear weapons from regular surveillance to causing the equipment to malfunction all the way to possibly setting into motion the actual launch sequence. We're going to have some big picture speculation on what it all might mean and some great observations from Robert on ufology. It's jam-packed with some really riveting information from Robert Hastings, who has really carved out a fantastic niche here studying UFOs and nuclear bases. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Robert Hastings, let me give a little bit of background on him. Robert Hastings was born at Sandia Base, New Mexico, May 6, 1950, during a period of high UFO activity at the base and nearby Kirtland Air Force Base. His father, Sergeant Robert E. Hastings, was career Air Force, and the Hastings family were stationed at Maelstrom Air Force Base in 1966-67 to during one of the peak periods of UFO activity at nearby ICBM sites. That's what sparked his interest in UFOs. He received his BFA in photography at Ohio University in 1972. He almost completed a master's program in instructional technology, media directed toward educational ends, but gave that up in 1981 to go out on the college lecture circuit to speak on the UFO nukes connection. Thus far, he has spoken at over 500 colleges and universities nationwide. In 1986 to 1988, he retrained in electron microscopy at San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton, California, and received a certificate in material science applications. Between 1988 and 2002, he was employed as a laboratory analyst by Phillips Semiconductors in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but continued to lecture at colleges part-time, averaging 25 to 30 programs per year. He is currently semi-retired, but still lectures on UFOs. Unfortunately, Robert does not have a website, but if you go to the page where you found this interview at banalofamerica.com, you'll find three great links to articles written by Robert Hastings that we discussed throughout this interview. Uh, You can link up to those at the page, and you'll be able to get tons more material from Robert Hastings regarding his research. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll, folks. This interview was recorded on May 30th, 2007. Robert Hastings talking about the UFO nukes connection on Ben All of America Audio Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Ben All of America Audio. This week, our guest is Robert Hastings, who has been studying the UFO phenomenon for over 30 years. He's just done an amazing amount of work, and he's focused on the UFO nukes connection, nuclear weapons, that is, and the strange the strange situation with UFO sightings over nuclear bases, not just in America, but also all over the world. And well, what's going on with that connection? And that's what we're going to talk about with Robert Hastings. And we're also going to find out a little bit about his travels in the world of ufology over the years and, and how he thinks things are shaping up in the UFO field. So welcome to the show, Robert. Thank you. 
Um, well, let's start off first, obviously, with your bio and your background, how you gravitated toward the UFO subject in the first place. My father was career Air Force, and in 1966 and 67, he was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. Uh, many of your listeners probably already know that there were a number of uh, now well-publicized UFO sightings at the base uh, Minuteman, uh, Minuteman nuclear weapons sites during that period. Um, I happened to actually see five UFOs on radar, five targets. At the time, I was 16 going on 17 and worked as a custodian in the base air traffic control tower. And I did actually witness with my own eyes, according to the FAA controller who was talking to me, uh, that these objects were clearly not aircraft uh, and that jet fighters had been launched to investigate. When I excitedly mentioned all of this to my father, he made inquiries, uh, unbeknownst to me actually, but later told me that there was confirmation, uh, probably third hand at that point, that indeed these were bona fide UFOs uh, maneuvering near uh, silos, missile installations out at a location called Judith Basin. Uh, a county with a number of missile silos. Um, so that was my introduction to the subject. I was quite fascinated and intrigued by what I witnessed and what I was subsequently told. And by 1973, I was uh, enamored enough of the subject that I decided to begin interviewing former and retired Air Force personnel uh, regarding their own experiences, not only at Malmstrom, but at other Air Force bases. Uh, I was interested in any type of incident involving UFOs, but very quickly came to focus on sightings involving nuclear weapons. What made you decide to focus on that nuclear aspect? Obviously, uh, people who follow the UFO phenomenon know about how, how intricate that, that is to the UFO phenomenon, but a lot of people, it's sort of uh, under the under the radar, with lot for, <laughs> yeah, no, no pun intended, I guess, um, <laughs> in, in the mainstream, really, I guess. But um, but what made you focus on the nuclear aspect of, of the UFO phenomenon? Well, it seemed to me self-evident that, uh, especially for anyone who grew up in the Cold War era, uh, that the uh, threat of nuclear war seemed to always be hanging over our heads. Uh, I remember in elementary school and even high school at Air Force bases having regular atomic bomb drills, nuclear bomb drills, where we would have to duck under desks. I think that went on nationwide, uh, especially during the 1950s. Um, so there was always this threat that we were going to engage in thermonuclear uh, war with the Soviet Union and you know, conceivably could end human civilization if indeed something like that transpired. Um, so the fact that UFOs seem to be interested in nosing around, uh, surveilling whatever, our nuclear weapons seem to me very significant. And uh, very quickly I came to the conclusion that probably one of the primary reasons that UFO sightings acceler accelerated dramatically post-World War II was the fact that we had nuclear weapons. Uh, by probably the mid-70s, I became aware of the writings of Captain Edward Ruppelt, who was the first chief of Project Blue Book. Uh, in his book, published in 1956, The Report of, on Unidentified Flying Objects, Ruppelt made a number of explicit statements about UFOs flying around nuclear weapons sites ranging from the Los Alamos Nuclear Weapons Lab to Sandia Base in Albuquerque, where coincidentally I was born, and uh, oh, wow. other other nuclear weapons-related facilities, the Oak Ridge National Laboratories, uh, where weapons-grade uranium and plutonium was produced, where uh, also at the Hanford site in Washington, where uh, plutonium was produced for nuclear weapons. So even the Air Force was very aware of and concerned by nuclear weapons-related sightings uh, as of the late 1940s and early 50s. So it seemed to me that... Um, Whatever else UFOs are up to, um, one of the principal themes, the more and more I dug into it, uh, it seemed to be uh, involving nuclear weapons. And you said uh, you started in, in 73 starting to interview these um, whistleblowers, for lack of a better term. How did you find uh, people to speak out on what they saw while they were in the military? That sounds like it would be a hard nut to crack. Um, so how did you find these people? And, and, um, and, and then, you know, how did you go about figuring out what, what they had to say? 
Well, you're absolutely correct. Um, I would say, you know, one out of 20 or one out of 50 people actually had something significant to say to me. However, given that my background was Air Force and the fact that my dad was career, I had a number of acquaintances uh, through him and other persons I came into contact with who had Air Force backgrounds, of course, either um, active duty or retired. So I just began informally asking questions of people. Not surprisingly, most of the people I spoke with had no knowledge of anything involving UFOs, or at least that's what they told me. I I think most of them were sincere. Um, My gut told me clearly that some of them were being deceptive, but I viewed that as their prerogative, um, and I didn't really push the issue with rare exceptions. At some point in time, uh, there began to be a groundswell of responses, um, probably by about the mid-70s, where people were discussing with me their knowledge of one incident or another involving UFOs. Uh, radar, radar operators were discussing objects being tracked that could not be identified as aircraft by their velocities, their uh, erratic maneuvers, um, some cases uh, objects doing uh, performing maneuvers that no aircraft on earth could match. So the people who were telling me these stories were quite impressed themselves by what they had witnessed. Um, I also began discussing or asking persons with the knowledge of nuclear weapons cases to elaborate um, as to their knowledge of, of these events. Um, these people were very tight-lipped with rare exceptions, but at some point when I began um, summarizing formally my interviews and providing these people with the interview summaries, a number of them uh, seemed to be relieved that other people were talking about yeah. these events and um, more or less uh, went on the record either more or less uh, specifically. And I'm talking about at this point uh, several hundred persons, wow. re- former and retired Air Force personnel by this point in time, 2007, who've discussed various issues with me. Uh, some of the individuals are extremely explicit. Uh, for example, um, then Lieutenant Robert Salas was a nuclear missile launch officer at Malmstrom Air Force Base during the same period when my dad was there. Um, Salas has gone online with his uh, research associate, Jim Klotz, and have just laid out chapter and verse what occurred at Malmstrom at his particular launch control facility. Uh, Salas was underground with his uh, co-commander, and when they got a frantic call from a guard topside at ground level saying, sir, there's a UFO hovering over the site, uh, Salas has said he thought this was a joke and was kind of indignant that this guard would make jokes over this very secure line. And he said, well, just, you know, keep me up, keep me informed. Um, minutes later, the guy, same guard called back and was frantic, if not scared, and said, sir, it's directly over the site. And one of the guards has been in, issued, uh, injured, rather. Um, Salas said he had not even the time to wake up his, his co-commander to explain what was going on when suddenly on their missile readiness display panel in the underground launch capsule, they observed that one by one, the 10 Minuteman missiles that they themselves controlled would, would launch in the time of war began to malfunction one after the other, uh, what the Air Force calls dropping off alert status. Um, long story short, Salas was debriefed by uh, what's called OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, was sworn to secrecy and did not tell his story until 1995 when he began working with Jim Klotz. So that's the type of incident that... Um, I've heard about from not only Salas, but other individuals, uh, objects hovering directly over nuclear missile launch control facilities. In some instances, not all, but in some instances, uh, missiles malfunction immediately thereafter. Um, interestingly, uh, the missile maintenance personnel I've talked to have described uh, cases where apparently targeting tapes or other types of targeting technology has been scrambled in effect. and um, you know, following these incidents requiring sometimes the complete uh, removal uh, of those particular missiles and replacement with others. So obviously this is some very dramatic stuff and these sources are persons that the U.S. government has entrusted with um, 
the launching of nuclear weapons or the guarding of nuclear weapons, the maintenance of nuclear weapons, persons who are given psychological tests, uh, persons who are considered obviously uh, trustworthy in, in these very dramatic uh, circumstances of launching missiles in time of war, uh, potentially killing millions of people. I mean, these are people who are not your average Joe on the street, and they're <laughs> speaking of incidents involving UFOs hovering above their missiles, and in some cases, apparently tampering with their missiles' functionality. So, in my view, this is self-evidently important and something that I've just really devoted my adult life to investigating. Exactly. Yeah. Well, kudos to you for for compiling that many solid witnesses. Those are those are witnesses of good stock, as you say. You know, these aren't uh, the proverbial farmer in the hayfield. These are uh, these are legit people who, you know, you, how can you not believe? And I see also that you, you've sort of tried to supplement some of your um, witness testimony with freedom of information requests and and, and, uh, and document type searches. It sounds like that that's the sort of thing that's actually not, not too easy because these sort of things are kind of scrubbed from the record. How, how easy or hard is it to get information via the government regarding these incidents? I began filing freedom of information requests in the early 1980s, and what I found very quickly is that um, my responses were essentially no response at all. Uh, I tried to get uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigations records uh, based on the testimony of my sources saying that on such and such a date at such and su such a base, this incident occurred and I was debriefed by OSI. Well, according to OSI, in response to my freedom of information requests, they had no document, zero documents relating to the incidents that I was petitioning for. Um, they basically had the blanket statement, all files, uh, OS files, OSI files relating to UFO sightings were declassified when Project Blue Book files were declassified. Um, that is not the case. And um, so what I've decided to do over the years is concentrate on the witness interviews yeah. simply because uh, I just think that I'm not going to get anywhere else, anywhere. Uh, some of my research associates, Jim Klotz, for example, has filed FOIA requests on my behalf. He's got nowhere with OSI and other agencies that might have a knowledge of these nuclear weapons related cases. So we think the stonewalling is such that um, we're not going to get anywhere, basically. Nevertheless, um, over the years, uh, Dr. Bruce McAbee, for example, uh, succeeded in getting a number of FBI documents relating to nuclear weapons cases that the FBI uh, were privy to back in the early uh, late 40s and early 50s. Um, pretty much before they were cut out by the Air Force. Uh, there was a lot of sharing of information about the early UFO sightings in New Mexico at the Los Alamos Labs, Sandia Labs in Albuquerque, uh, other Oak Ridge, Hanford, other sites. And um, the documents also clearly indicate that CIA took an interest, a strong interest, and perhaps even a, a controlling interest in these types of events. Um, but the, the record, the paperwork, the paper trail is fragmentary. Uh, what is known is, is pretty uh, hit or miss. And um, events from about the mid-60s on, early 60s even, the paper trail just dries up uh, with rare exceptions involving uh, the nuclear weapons-related cases. So it's, it's a very tightly guarded secret. It obviously has national security-related implications. And I think the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies who are monitoring the situation, gathering the data and suppressing the data have just concluded that, you know, all of this will be beyond freedom of information, uh, uh, you know, release. Yeah. Um, and we had uh, we had a special episode actually uh, about a month ago with Paul Kimball. He did a cable special, uh, 10 best UFO cases, and a lot of them were in one of them obviously was the Maelstrom one. And, and many of them also were kind of in this vein with military type witnesses and radar returns and that kind of thing. And obviously these must be the, the, the cream of the crop, so I can see why the, the government would want to keep them under wraps. I, I, I think that's true. I think uh, there are um, any number of uh, – there is any number of uh, sources who are 
willing to come forward and talk about what they know, but uh, again, backing it up with documentation has been extremely difficult. Uh, Bob Salas, by the way, the gentleman I mentioned who was at Malmstrom Air Force Base in 67, is going to be one of the key speakers at the MUFON conference in Denver in August. And I strongly recommend that anybody attending the conference attend Mr. Salas's lecture because he uh, will stick to the nuts and bolts. Uh, he, he obviously has credentials. And whereas a lot of other research into UFOs involves a great deal of speculation, uh, Mr. Salas will just tell you chapter and verse what occurred to him and what took place. Um, there are, to my knowledge, at least five other former or retired missile launch officers at Malmstrom who've also gone on the record about uh, the incidents that Mr. Salas is willing to describe. All of them are pretty reticent. They're, they're certainly not as willing to go uh, full out as Mr. Salas is in terms of publicizing their experiences, but they have gone on the record as to those experiences occurring and their knowledge of them. Um, for example, I uh, about five or six years ago interviewed a man named, <clears throat> excuse me, Bob Peiser, or excuse me, Bob Jamison, uh, who was at the time of the Malmstrom incidents a missile uh, targeting officer uh, who was actually in charge of making sure that in time of war the missiles would land where they were designated to land. Um, he said that he was involved in personally involved in at least two separate UFO-related missile shutdowns where large numbers of Minuteman missiles malfunctioned simultaneously, precisely at a time, just moments later after reports of UFOs above their uh, positions came in to the, the launch officers. And, um, you know, so these are persons that, that have some uh, – Credentials obviously know what they're talking about, and they're willing to go on the record finally about these things occurring. And how do you overcome uh, the problem? We've talked about this on the show with uh, with ufologists, especially uh, people who work with the whistleblowers, of uh, ufology sort of turning on the whistleblowers or, or putting them through the ringer. And it, a lot of times, you know, it, the whistleblower at the end of the day will be like, you know, it wasn't worth it because I came up forward with this thing and then the UFO people completely turned on me. Obviously, you don't do that. You're, you're trying to find find the whistleblowers. But, I mean, how do you deal with that, that you know, uh, cannibalistic attitude of ufology? Well, when I'm interviewing the persons I talk to, the sources that I uncover at, or in, on occasion just drop in my lap, um, I, I myself put them through a rigorous series of questions. I require that they provide their service records to me, substantiating their presence in these squadrons at those bases at the time of the incidents. And I have uh, any number of very um, uh, probing questions that I ask each and every one of them just to uh, satisfy my own sense that they know what they're talking about and that they're credible. So I make it clear to them that you know, if they're willing to go on the record with me and if I'm going to publish what they're saying uh, with their permission, then they've got to be able to substantiate as best as possible what they're telling me. Yeah. Um, beyond that, as far as the response of ufology in general or the public in general to these cases, years ago I just, I just adopted the posture of um, taking what comes because it's, it's a, it's, uh, the whole process has a life of itself, uh, popular perceptions of UFOs, uh, skeptics and debunkers perceptions of UFOs, and all of that mm -hmm. um, is nothing that's going to be significantly modified, um, I, I think. I think there will always be controversy associated with this subject until once and for all uh, the reality of UFOs is, is demonstrated beyond any doubt. So I don't let it worry me uh, or I'm not concerned by the fact that some people will always doubt the validity of this data. Before I did the research, I had a question for you, and then, I, and then when I started doing it, it actually sort of answered my question, and, and that it was that it seemed like these nuclear sightings happened a lot in the past and weren't happening nowadays, but then when I read your your uh, report here. Uh, let me give the address for the report for people. Get a pen and paper, folks. Here it is. Uh, www.nicap.org slash Babylon slash missile underscore incidents dot htm. And we'll have a link at the uh, the page with your find the interview. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to get to the site that we're talking about here that has a paper published by Robert 
you have a compendium there of a lot of key cases and, and sightings all over nuclear bases. And what I found interesting and, and answered the question was one of the first that I had when we were planning the interview was about this uh, later time period of UFO over nu- over nuke base sightings. Is that there seems to have been uh, a series of sightings in the 90s uh, over Malmstrom Air Force Base and uh, a few other ones. This isn't a phenomenon that, that came and went in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's still kind of going on. Well, what I found, if uh, one goes online and tries to search Google, for example, for uh, nuclear weapons-related UFO cases, um, as far as the uh, ICBM cases, the nuclear missile cases, almost uh, probably 80% just off the top of my head, the the majority of the material relates to the incidents that were reported at Malmstrom Air Force Base in 1967. Mm -hmm. However, what I have found and other researchers have found who dug into this in depth is that indeed this is an ongoing situation. Um, Nuclear missiles came online, began to be deployed around 1960, uh, depending on how you use the benchmarks that have been published. But operationally, nuclear missiles took hold, right, or were were deployed right around 1960. And um, I have discovered that even the first generation of nuclear missiles that we use, the Atlas missiles, uh, were visited by UFOs uh, at a number of bases, including Walker Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico, F.E. Warren Air Force Base outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming, and other Atlas bases. So from the get-go, when missiles came online, they were being visited by disc-shaped objects. Um, the, the article, the online article you just referenced of mine, um, I, I have, I think, five or six individuals, launch officers and missile maintenance personnel at Walker Air Force Base, describing saucer-shaped objects hovering over nuclear missile silos, uh, racing away instantaneously at high velocity and then instantaneously stopping over adjacent missile silos. Uh, that information comes from a launch officer named uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Philip Moore, and uh, so he's one of the people who's gone online about it. Another uh, former launch officer, then Lieutenant Jerry Nelson, has talked about at this one site he was at, uh, site number nine, Atlas site number nine, repeatedly over about a month, uh, he estimated somewhere around six, uh, half a dozen to a dozen cases, uh, instances rather, where an unlit object hovered silently and directly over the missile silo, but shone a bright light down on it before racing away. And he said the guards were just panic stricken by this. They couldn't explain what was going on. So the types of events that have been reported uh, at Malmstrom in the late 60s were preceded by events at other bases in the earlier generations of nuclear missile deployment. Um, as you mentioned, I've also interviewed persons, uh, missile maintenance personnel, and others who were involved at Malmstrom uh, with nuclear missiles in the mid 1990s, and indeed they're reporting virtually the same kinds of instances that were going on two decades, three decades earlier. So this is an ongoing process. My opinion, based on what I know of all this after this many years of researching it, is that probably within the last year, somewhere at some nuclear missile base, there was an incident of this type. But it will probably take uh, years for persons to come forward uh, after they've left the Air Force, after they've left active duty, uh, who are willing to discuss these incidents. So there's always this built-in, generally speaking, uh, delay factor. Mm-hmm. But yes, um, indeed, there are a number of inst- instances of these types of events occurring at various bases in the 1990s. Um, and then uh, one of the cases that you, you seem to have uh, paid a little bit of extra attention to in the past few months or whatever, and, and, and you sent me an article about it, and maybe we could touch on here. I don't have a lot of like specific case-type questions, but this one I want to touch on. That's the Big Sur case of 1964, because that's almost like a case study of, of what you do by, you know, finding the whistleblowers and then trying to uh, get past, you do a great job in the article that you sent me, uh, and what what magazine was that in? Oh, it's in the International UFO Reporter, which is the uh, quarterly publication of the Center for UFO Studies, QFOS. Uh, if your listeners go online and type in uh, Big Sur UFO, Sur is S-U-R, Big Sur UFO, Hastings, 
uh, you'll find references, uh, actually the entire article reprinted. It's now online. And um, yes, it's, it's extraordinary. I consider it one of the top uh, half dozen cases that I'm aware of involving UFOs and nuclear weapons that sort of substantiates the reality of it. You've got two key sources, retired Air Force or former or retired Air Force personnel officers um, who've gone on the record saying that in September of 1964 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, an Atlas missile was test launched. It was carrying an experimental payload uh, warhead that was designed to release chaff, uh, aluminum chaff, around the warhead up in space, which was designed to confuse uh, Soviet radar defenses uh, so they would not, if they had uh, anti-missile capability and attempted to shoot down the warhead, they would not be able to differentiate between the warhead and the chaff. So that was the purpose of the experiment. Um, The two officers that retired, former retired officers that have gone on record, Um, Robert Jacobs, who was the chief of the photo uh, instrumentation unit at Vandenberg, and another gentleman named uh, Major Florence Mansman, who was one of the chief uh, photo optical uh, um, interpreters. I I don't have his exact title in my my mind at the moment, but in any event, these two people have independently confirmed that while they were filming uh, the launch of this missile test, and after the warhead, the dummy warhead, had separated from the booster, they actually picked up on film a UFO coming into camera frame, circling the dummy warhead at four different points, flashing bright uh, lightning bolt types of uh, beams at the warhead, whereupon, according to both officers, the warhead began to tumble and fell into the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles short of its target. Lieutenant Jacobs has characterized this as, quote, a shot across the bow of our nuclear silliness ship, end quote. (laughs) And in my view, that just hits the nail right on the head. I think that's exactly what was going on. Somebody uh, obviously in possession of superior technology was demonstrating that they had the ability to interfere with uh, nuclear uh, weapons in space, uh, nuclear warheads in space. Now, um, the uh, organization PSYCOP, uh, the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of them. It's been a UFO debunking group, um, paranormal debunking group now for decades. Um, They published an article in 1993 uh, by a man named Kingston George, who was also involved with this particular series of launches at Vandenberg. Uh, Kingston George claims that uh, Lieutenant Jacobs' report about this incident was totally off base. There was nothing involving UFOs, that in fact uh, they were simply misidentifying what they were observing on film, which was a a type of um, decoy or dummy experiment, and uh, these objects that were being deployed as dummy decoy uh, uh, warheads were misidentified as a UFO. Well, I have personally found, as I described in the article, um, a number of factual errors. Mr. George just totally misrepresented what Lieutenant Jacobs uh, said about the launch, said about what was captured on film. And in my view, I've totally demolished Mr. George's skeptical debunking assessment of the case. So I think... uh, if for no other reason, persons who are aware of Big Sur and the controversy around it, um, I think they would find my article quite illuminating in terms of uh, my identifying a number of fundamental, fundamental errors in the debunking treatment of the case. Yeah, yeah. And we'll have a link up to uh, – I'll, I'll Google that up and, and find it, and we'll have a link up to it uh, on the on the page with the interview so people can check that out. Uh, your reference – to the other article that I have online at the nightcap.org website. If you search Google simply for UFO ICBM, uh, you'll find it almost immediately. Yeah, yeah. And and like I said, we'll uh, we'll have all the links up. Hopefully, people will be able to find them and, and stuff. And uh, I'm sure they will because uh, we'll we'll make it as readily available as possible. Uh, how about a ballpark figure here on how many of these UFO nuclear uh, incidents? have you actually like discovered at this point do you have a number uh off the top of your head where you think you you can put at i don't off the top of my head um i mean if you if depending on what database we're talking about reports that were um 
written about in declassified documents as opposed to interviews I've conducted with, with individuals, I don't know what the total would be. I can tell you that the number of persons that I've interviewed since 1973 who, uh, in my view, are credible witnesses speaking about nuclear weapons-related UFO cases, uh, the number of persons I've interviewed is approximately 60 um, at this point in time. Uh, the number of persons that I've interviewed about uh, UFO sightings in general by Air Force personnel is is in the range of several hundred at this point. I, I wouldn't be able to quantify it for you. Now, you've talked a lot here about UFOs sort of tinkering with, with the nukes, messing with the controls or, or interfering in the tests and that kind of thing. Um, would you say that that's the predominant? overarching theme of these UFO nuclear connection, or would you say that's like more of a small subsection when the UFO gets proactively involved in it? Is it, you know, is that more the norm that, that the UFO is going to be doing something to the nuke, or is it more often than not they're just surveying what's going on? Uh, again, I would have difficulty quantifying the, the ratio. However, I would say the majority, the overwhelming majority of the cases that I'm aware of, based on the testimony of these former and retired Air Force personnel, uh, the majority of the cases would simply involve what, what one might characterize as surveillance, UFO surveillance of nuclear weapons sites. However, there is this subcategory of probably six or seven cases that I'm aware of uh, from these witness interviews where there was actually apparently uh, deliberate premeditated tampering or interruption of the missiles, missiles functionality. Uh, one might argue that these are simply incidental incidents that, um, for example, the UFO is um, emanating some sort of field effect which uh, inadvertently in interferes with the missile's electronics, uh, thereby uh, causing the malfunction. That's indeed in the realm of possibility, my, but my opinion and the opinion of the majority of my sources is that no, there was a premeditated, deliberate demonstration uh, by whoever was on board the UFO that indeed they could interfere with our nuclear weapons functionality. Based on what the witnesses tell you, um, what's the general reaction from their higher-ups when something like this goes down? Just to sort of hush them up, is it commonplace to the point where, you know, to the, to the big dog, you know, they come into town to the to the Air Force base and they're like, you know, this happens all the time, so just shut your mouth kind of thing. Or, or is it more like, you know, they're spooked too? It really varies. And uh, I was discussing this very question with Bob Salas, the, uh, the former missile launch officer at Malmstrom within the past week. Uh, we were discussing uh, the various ways that these kinds of incidents have been handled over the years. And, you know, it almost seems that there's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, what I have, for example, to give you some examples, um, a man named Walter Billings, who was a, a lieutenant, a missile launch officer at F.E. Warren Air Force Base in the early 1970s, uh, describes an incident one evening in the fall of 1973 where while he was on duty in alert down in one of these underground launch capsules, he and his commander uh, heard on the radio uh, linking all of the other launch control capsules that suddenly a what's called security alert team uh, group of missile police, uh, air policemen were um, – Responding to an alarm at one of these missile silos, there had been some sort of intrusion. What Mr. Billings and persons uh, connected to all of these 20 launch control facilities heard was that uh, as this team of Air Force police approached the missile silo, they observed a UFO right next to the missile silo. In fact, I believe he said hovering directly over the missile silo. Now, when this was uh, investigated, uh, Billing said that as soon as all the crews got back to base, they were uh, basically told not to discuss the incident. But the only team, the only two missile officers that were interrogated, according to Billings, uh, interrogated by OSI, uh, were the team of the launch control facility that was in charge of, of uh, the particular launch facility, the missile in question. Mm -hmm. So you have sort of a dual response. You have persons who are directly involved, presumably the missile security alert team, in addition to the launch officers for that group of missiles, being debriefed by OSI. In fact, Billing said those guys wouldn't talk to anyone afterwards. 
On the other hand, the other people who were indirectly aware of the incidents were basically just told as a group, don't discuss this, but there was no individual debriefing. I have found similar responses or similar descriptions at other bases at other time frames from the 60s into the 90s. And have there ever been anything uh, that you would like sort of classify as a close call type of situation? It sounds more like the UFOs shut down the nukes, but have there ever been any sort of situation where, you know, they turn them on? Um, I am not personally aware of any incident in the United States of this type where the launch sequence was activated. But indeed, there apparently are is at least one instance of that very uh, development within the, the former Soviet Union, I believe in October of 82, off the top of my head here, uh, at a launch facility in the Ukraine. Um, reporter George Knapp, who uh, has done a lot of investigating uh, um, regarding Soviet UFO incidents, uh, uh, published documents, uh, interviewed persons who were involved, in this incident whereby apparently a um, UFO hovered over this missile base for several hours at a high altitude where Soviet fighters could not reach it and at some point down in one of these launch control facilities um, the launch officers were horrified to see that the missile launch sequence for this one missile had activated itself with no human intervention and apparently for 15 seconds this automated launch sequence was proceeding apace um, while the people frantically were attempting to shut it down to no avail. Um, after this 15 second period, uh, the, the electronic functioning of the system tur returned to normal. Um, as I recall, Knapp said that the Soviet officer involved said that all of the equipment was disassembled, disassembled and no evidence of any kind of um, uh, anomaly could be found in it. So apparently you have, at least in this instance, not a question, not an instance of uh, interruption of functionality of the missile, but actual activation of it. Uh, if such a thing has occurred in the U.S., I have not heard about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that actually touches on the next question I was going to ask you, and that's about this international aspect of, uh, of the UFO phenomenon and nuclear and the nuclear thing. Um, outside of the USSR and the one you just talked about, have you discovered much elsewhere with regards to this sort of thing? Um, I, I do not really research um, sightings elsewhere in the world. I mean, I have a very... Um, full plate with just what's going on in the U.S. here, but I take a more than a passing interest in it, of course. Um, I've heard stories that I could not substantiate um, regarding incidents occurring, sightings occurring in Pakistan and India in the late 90s at a time when uh, there were nuclear weapons tests uh, by both uh, countries, underground uh, detonations. There were uh, reportedly a number of UFO sightings in that region following or around the time of those particular series of tests. Um, but I have not been able, I have not really pursued in terms of trying to locate and interview witnesses um, who, who might have knowledge of that. Um, getting back to uh, U.S. forces in England, uh, the famous Bentwaters case that most of your listeners have probably heard about in December of 1980. I have interviewed the deputy base commander, Charles Halt, about a year ago, and he substantiated and, in fact, went into greater detail uh, regarding what he had already said publicly for 20 years now, that, in fact, while they were sighting UFOs out in the woods near the air base and quite clearly dealing with objects that were vastly beyond conventional aircraft in terms of their capabilities, Halt has confirmed to me and to other uh, researchers and, and journalists that uh, at least one of the objects was reported hovering directly over the weapons uh, storage area where uh, unspecified types of nuclear weapons were stored, either um, missile warheads, tactical missile warheads, which would be used in a, in a battlefield setting, or other types of nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the fascinating thing about this particular, this particular UFO incursion at the weapons storage area is that a number of guards and Halt himself saw the UFO shooting what seemed to be a laser-like beam directly down onto one of the laser, or uh, weapons bunkers, rather. And um, so that type of thing obviously is quite dramatic. Um, 
even though it occurred in, in, in England, it involved U.S. nuclear weapons. Um, getting back, jumping back again to the Soviet, Soviet Union, uh, there's another case on record that your listeners can find online. Uh, there was a Soviet uh, missile test facility called Kapustin Yar, uh, K-A-P-U-S-T-I-N-Y-A-R, uh, which had a number of... Uh, facilities involved with nuclear missile testing and so on. And in July of 1989, according to declassified KGB documents, uh, Soviet uh, uh, intelligence agency documents, uh, there was actually an instance of a UFO hovering over that facility's nuclear weapons storage facility and shooting a beam of light down into it, virtually a carbon copy of what Colonel Halt has described uh, as having occurred at the Bentwater space. So very intriguing um, kinds of things going on on both sides of the ocean. Um, certainly, um, you know, the, the kinds of events that my s sources are describing in, in the U.S. have been occurring in the Soviet Union and now Russia. Yeah, yeah. And um, and to, to sort of like take a big picture, look at all this, and I'm sure it's, um, it's obviously speculative because we don't know what's going on in the minds of the, uh, the pilots of the UFOs, whatever they may be. But uh, what do you think is the message here with this UFO nuke connection? They're not happy with what we're doing with the nukes? Um, when I speak publicly, in particular in my lectures, I try to uh, limit my personal opinions um, and just let the the facts speak for themselves, mm -hmm. the documents and the testimony of these uh, retired military people. And I, I insert a minimum of my own um, perspective on the subject. But obviously, uh, one could not have studied this subject for 30 years and not have an opinion about what's going on. Yeah. So my opinion is that uh, the technology that's involved with the UFO phenomenon is so uh, in, in advance of anything that we humans have uh, from the 40s to the present day, I think clearly we're dealing with a technology that has not um, been demonstrated to exist on Earth. Therefore, we're dealing with beings from somewhere else, uh, whether they be extraterrestrial or interdimensional, I don't presume to know. But I think clearly you've got an intelligence uh, involved with the phenomenon and it, it seems apparent to me uh, that one of the items on their agenda uh, in terms of their interaction at this point in human history is quite clearly connected to nuclear weapons and our possession of them, our, threat, our testing them, our threatened use of them in, in war and so on. I think that clearly uh, is involved with what's going on in terms of what they're doing, their activities at this point in time. Yeah. Um, I tend to agree with the majority of my sources that uh, someone is demonstrating that they have the ability to interfere with our use of nuclear weapons. Whether or not these small-scale incidents could be duplicated on a worldwide scale, if, if you know, worse came to worse, and we and some other country, either China or Russia, do at some point in our future decide to go to, to war and use nuclear weapons, whether or not uh, the same kinds of disruptions that have been um, reported at various Air Force bases and so on could be uh, affected worldwide so that every nuclear missile launch could be interfered with, I don't presume to know. And uh, I suspect that the Pentagon and CIA and the Kremlin and the, K uh, the successor to the KGB probably don't have a clue either. Yeah, kind of uh, probably almost as a, an additional layer of mutually assured destruction in a sense, where now they're probably wondering if, uh, if they'd even be able to use them at this point. Well, uh, yeah, it's it's Let, an open. Let's hope they it, don't. It's an open question. Um, you know, there's uh, speculation is a game that anyone can play, and you know, you asked me my two cents, so I gave them to you. But I think clearly, what beyond mere speculation, just in terms of documenting what's taken place, uh, you've got an ongoing pattern of surveillance by UFOs at nuclear weapon sites. You have uh, also uh, a more limited number of. of instances of apparent disruption, in my mind, premeditated disruption of those systems. That's that's about all one can say uh, with any legitimacy at this point, I think. Yeah. And uh, and now this one also is kind of speculative, but uh, maybe you might have heard more from, from your witnesses and that kind of thing. And that is, uh, have there been any sort of attempts by the government to thwart 
this uh, UFO interference on the nuclear bases. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about, you know, like the Star Wars, the SDI thing maybe being used against UFOs, not for nuclear weapons after all, and that sort of thing, or, or maybe even engaging uh, pilots to, you know, chase off the UFOs. Is there any, um, any history of that sort of thing where, you know, instead of just being like, oh, no, there's a UFO over the thing, they're like, get it. <laughs> uh, there are countless, I would say hundreds if not thousands of instances of UFOs being chased by military jet aircraft around the world. Um, I can attest both from declassified documents and from the statements provided to me by um, FAA controllers at Malmstrom Air Force Base that in fact uh, jets were launched to investigate uh, UFO um, uh, incursions of sensitive uh, sensitive airspace, in other words, at these nuclear missile silos. So I know these after the fact uh, responses were were undertaken. As far as proactively attempting to protect weapons, like through Star Wars technology or something like that, I've heard those rumors for 20 years. Yeah. I'm sure everyone else has, but I'm unaware of any real um, substantiation to the fact that that's going on. All right. Um, that that kind of wraps up the, uh, the the nuke portion of the discussion, and I want to move in now to like a general ufology talk here. Um, and then the first thing I wanted to ask you about uh, from from uh, luckily I keep we keep referencing <laughs> things we, uh, we find online, but I will I'll try and maybe put a link up to this too. And that was uh, someone transcribed a presentation of yours, and uh, you mentioned that you had personally investigated. Um, what I, what I guess could be dubbed as the Benowitz saga at Kirtland Air Force Base, and I think you're you're uh, you're kind of situated in that area anyway. So I'm sure being a part of ufology in that area during that time must have been just a heady experience. So uh, let's talk about your investigation into what was going on with the Benowitz story. Oh, that's a very long story. Um, I can simply say that I am one of the few people who met with him face to face at his Thunder Scientific Laboratories, I believe off the top of my head here in the spring of 85, 1985. Uh, I was with him close to two hours and in my lay opinion, not being a psychiatrist, my lay opinion is that the man was uh, sadly uh, psychotic. He was clearly mentally unbalanced and um, I feel a little uncomfortable to be honest with you going into some of the things that he told me and showed me because they were in my mind demonstrations of his uh, psychosis yeah. and uh, he's dead as I think most people know um, his family is still in Albuquerque. They still operate the labs, and I just think it might be indelicate of me to describe it in, at okay. length uh, what I witnessed, so I'm not going to go there. Um, in the same context, though, um, the, the so-called MJ-12 papers, documents that have been circulating now for 20 years, I did uh, investigate them and uh, the persons involved with, in my view, producing them. I think they are fraudulent. I think they are probably disinformation. Uh, clearly, a retired uh, OSI agent named Richard Doty was up to his neck in disseminating this information, as was ufologist Bill Moore. Uh, whether Moore was duped by by Doty or uh, was knowledgeably uh, participating in a disinformation scheme, I think is open to question. Um, Moore has discussed at length his involvement and how he, in effect, was recruited by Doty to disseminate information. But um, he, based on what I've read, he more or less tries to present himself as somebody who was playing along with Doty to ferret out the good secrets. In my view, he was probably uh, just manhandled by Doty from day one. And um, the bottom line is a lot of BS, in my view, has been circulated about the Roswell incident, about other supposed classified incidents involving UFOs, supposedly discussed at length in these MJ-12 papers. That in my view, there's no credible evidence, persuasive evidence of any kind of comprehensive uh, 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 character that would, would substantiate the validity of the MJ-12 papers. 
And um, now, aside from the meeting here with Venom, which the, obviously I agree with you, we, you don't want we don't want to touch that. So, um, but but aside from that, did you ever have any run-ins with Doty or or uh, or Bill Moore or or people like that during that period? Because it sounds like you know you're you're kind of in that area, and, and they were kind of trying to keep an eye on all the different ufologists in that area. And, and obviously, like we talked about, you're you're tackling the best of the best as far as UFO cases go for for quality. So. I can see and and touchy national security type stuff, so I can see how they'd want to keep an eye on you. So, do they ever, do they ever hassle you or or try and feed you misinformation or anything? Well, in March of '89, I circulated, didn't publish it. I circulated it uh, in the the UFO community um, a summary of my investigation into the MJ12 papers involving um, Doty and Moore and others. Um, within a month, Bill Moore actually showed up at my door. As it turns out, um, I didn't wasn't aware at the time, and I, I was long story short, I didn't even answer the door. But I didn't know he was there until after the fact. In any event, um, he uh, subsequently made a telephone threat, implying that he would sue me unless I retracted my statements about uh, Bill Moore in this paper. The paper is called the MJ12 Affair facts, questions, and comments, and it's available online. Um, so very quickly, uh, Bill Moore was trying to, um, let's say, he expressed, expressed his displeasure about what I had said publicly and was threatening, implying that he would threat, he would uh, take legal action against me if I didn't retract my statements. And yet, uh, in July of 89 at the MUFON conference in, La- conference in Las Vegas, the national conference, Bill Moore substantiated most of what I had said in my yeah. paper. He admitted that he had been recruited by Doty. Uh, there was uh, active uh, dissemination of disinformation involving uh, Linda Howe, uh, researcher Linda Howe involving Paul Benowitz and others. So he basically confirmed what I knew from my investigation of the case. Um, so he came after me. Doty also wrote me a nasty letter basically saying, none of this is true. I'm currently engaged in covert operations, but I do have a mailbox in Grants, New Mexico. Well, what I discovered was that he had already been uh, taken out of OSI. He uh, was involved in something that, that led him to be uh, his status as a special agent to be uh, withdrawn. He ended up working in a dining hall at Kirtland Air Force Base before he retired, uh, had no intelligence responsibilities whatsoever. And furthermore, at the time he told me he was doing covert ops, he was actually a uh, New Mexico State policeman busting speeders in Grants, New Mexico. That was his post-Air Force career. So I caught him in that little lie and threw it back at him and haven't heard from him since. Um, For the last nearly 20 years in my lectures, I have been, when I'm asked about MJ-12, laying all of this out, talking about what I know about the deceptions involved, the persons involved. And, you know, I've said if Doty or Moore or any of these people have any problem with what I'm saying, they can indeed have their attorneys contact my attorney. I think the only way all of this information is only going to be established as to what occurred and what didn't occur is in uh, a legal setting when everyone's under oath and uh, risk at, at risk of uh, penalty of perjury and so on. You know, in the meantime, the rest of them are just going to keep telling these falsehoods and engaging in these tall tales and this disinformation. And unfortunately, some gullible uh, segment of ufology is going to lap it up with a spoon. And um, it's sad, but there's really nothing can be done about it, in my view. Yeah, yeah. And um at the at the risk of uh, beating a dead horse, what do you what makes you so sure, or what what evidence do you use, or you know what what makes you come to the conclusion that the MJ12 documents are, are fraudulent? Just um, you know what what, uh, what what's your hit list here on that? Typewriter analysis has shown that uh, Doty was fabricating um, letters at, while at OSI. There was a typewriter at OSI at Kirtland that had a number of. This is back in the pre computer, pre-keyboard age, the actual physical typewriter that was being used had a number of identifiable flaws um, in the type, uh, in the type, the characters, the keys that struck the paper. 
And there were a number of uh, items, again, off the top of my head, this is 20 years ago, yeah. that supposedly were typed by different individuals at different bases, and um, they all came back to this typewriter that Doty had used at Kirtland OSI. And the reason I was able to tie that in was because Doty typed a letter to a, a man named Craig Whitesell in, uh, relating to a UFO sighting report in which he apparently used the same typewriter that had all the same identifiable um, key uh, stroke defects. So we clearly tied it into Doty typing at OSI Kirtland and then again extrapolating to these other documents, uh, this, identifying the same key effects, defects in these other fraudulent documents. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons. I, you know, what I point out in my paper is that, and this was again written in 1989, is that there was at that time, and to my mind there is to this day, not any credible evidence um, suggesting that an organization called MJ-12 ever existed. Um, I know that according to Linda Howe's testimony to me, uh, off the record comments at the time, that um, she was actually presented with some MJ-12 papers by Richard Doty and uh, another then Air Force officer, Robert Collins, in Thanksgiving of, I think, 1988 on Thanksgiving Day, as I recall. Uh, without looking at my records. And um, so clearly these guys were disseminating papers that purportedly had to do with this group MJ-12. Um, and at the same time, you have Doty um, fabricating various documents using this typewriter from Kirtland. So I think, you know, what are, what are we to deduce here? That yeah. some of what he was producing was fraudulent, but the other things he was presenting, Linda Howe, were absolutely real, authenticated documents? No, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think so. And if you look at anyone who familiarizes themselves with the controversy about what supposedly was found at the Nar National Archives involving MJ-12, um, the, the archivists, the leading archivists, I have letters from them saying that these were not properly uh, coded. They did not have designations suggesting they were actually a part of these files at the National Archives, that they were just, in effect, planted there in the view of the archivists. So there's any number of um, elements to this that, that point, in my mind, to the fact that the MJ-12 papers are fraudulent. Okay. All right. Um and uh, you, uh, you kind of fill in a lot of the backstory here a little bit for me because uh, we've I've had Greg Bishop on the show and we've talked about um, this whole mess of uh, at Kirtland Air Force Base back in the 80s and and so it's nice to hear from someone who also was it was on the trail of this uh, back in the day. As we discussed, obviously you've been in the UFO field here now for over 30 years and and sounds like you're a nuts and bolts sort of uh, researcher where, where you're interested in, in the solid witnesses and you're not chasing after some of this crazy stuff. Um, What's your opinion on how the UFO field has evolved over uh, the 30 years that you've been in it? Um, I've only been doing this for like five or six years, and I've been studying the history of it. I'm just amazed by the twists and turns that this, this uh, quasi-science has taken. So what's your opinion of it? Because you've, you've seen it from the, from the front lines. Um, I have to tell you that uh, the majority of the people that I speak with are former military people, and uh, a handful of researchers, such as Jim Klotz. Um, um, I don't really acquaint myself, I haven't acquainted myself with current developments in ufology, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. When I, when I uh, periodically see things online or things on the, uh, the, the, the UFO program series run by the History Channel, it just seems to me to be essentially the same as it was 30 years ago. You have people who are going after nuts and bolts kinds of data, and there are other people who are just kind of willing to accept any story that comes down the pike with a lot, not a lot of substantiation. Um, I think it's been qualitatively the same in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to the present day. Um, so I'm not sure that I would be a knowledgeable, I could knowledgeably answer uh, in terms of what, what trends are taking place in ufology. Okay. Um, and if you were, if you were like, if you could sort of lower it over the field, what direction would you like to see it go more towards this nuts and bolts thing? And, and, you know, um, there's a lot of, this is sort of activism, uh, that's sort of reemerging. Obviously the NICAP was a very activist organization in the seventies and that kind of died out. Um, 
But now in the 90s with this disclosure movement and, and this exopolitics, this sort of more of an activism that's coming along that's also at, you know, um, antagonistic at times with, with general ufology. Um, so do you, do you have a stance as far as, you know, the pure science-related study of UFOs versus um, the activist, proactive sort of UFO, get the truth out sort of attitude? Um, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, uh, I think this whole process has a life of its own. I think uh, in any controversial subject, you're going to have a diversity of opinions as to what's what and what's important, what's not important. Uh, there are people, for example, who um, I consider highly credible and uh, engaging in the nuts and bolts cases involving nuclear weapons and other kinds of military-related cases. Uh, specifically Kevin Randall, I'm thinking of as one person, and yet he and I differ sharply as to the validity of the abduction reports. I think there is a core number of UFO abduction reports that have merit uh, that are important part of the, the overall puzzle, whereas Kevin believes it's all um, psychological or decept deception of one kind or another, and really there is no physicality to the reports. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a complicated situation. Uh, I don't think anyone I know would completely agree with what I say in terms of persons I respect in the field. They probably disagree with what I'm saying, but have applauded me for other things I'm saying. And, and the same would hold true for me. I, you know, don't agree 100% with anybody. So I think that's just part of the sorting out process, um, not only with UFOs, but any kind of situation where, uh, science and or the general public is trying to, to, to make sense of some uh, unexplained phenomenon. As far as me lording over the field, that gets back to what I said earlier, too. My attitude has been um, I'm trying to take this subject on my terms. I'm not laying up at night worrying about it, going crazy about what direction it's taking and um, you know how I can influence or should be influencing the, the uh, course of events. I just think that would be foolish and a waste of time. It's going to have its own direction. It's going to go left, right, backwards, forwards, and I think that's part of the process, and I, I just don't worry myself about it. As we talked about earlier, you, you've been working on a book here, um, The UFO Nukes Connection. Any timetable on when we can see that uh, on the horizon? I'm hoping very early in 2008. Okay, awesome, awesome, and that'll be... That'll be uh, obviously your articles are rich with with stuff, and I, I, I presume that when the book comes out, it's just going to be just just the bomb, with no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Um, I'll I'll let my research stand on its own. I think the, the credibility of the sources is excellent. Um, I've tried to do them justice in terms of accurately reporting what they've had to say and uh, substantiate as best as possible, whenever possible, what they're saying in terms of declassified documents. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, most people will find it to be uh, worthy of their attention. Awesome. Yeah, when the book comes out, definitely we'll have you back on the show to, to delve even deeper into this subject. Very good. Thank you. Um, and, and so uh, what? obviously, like you said, the book, hopefully sometime early next year, what's next on the horizon for you? I know you're a very busy lecturer, so I presume you've got some some events uh, coming down the pike. So, uh, you know, what's, what's coming up for you uh, throughout the rest of 2007 and onward? Uh, the only two confirmed lecture dates that I have in the fall at this point, um, I can give them to you. Um, I'm going to be at the University of Connecticut in Storrs, Connecticut, on October 9th. And on the 25th of October, I'm going to be in Manchester, New Hampshire, um, at St. Anselm's College, and uh, persons interested in attending those programs can contact the school probably in the fall. I don't think you'll find anyone now who will have the details as far as the facilities and so on, but uh, in early October, you should be able to find out where the, the programs will be held. I also have several other lectures that I believe will come through in the fall, but they're not uh, confirmed dates at this point. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, well, feel free to shoot me an email when you get them, and uh, we'll, we'll post the information uh, on, on the page with the interview. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, Robert, thank you very much for coming on the show. Obviously, uh, you've done some great work, and, and you're doing great research into uh, key UFO cases, the important ones, and, and, and finding awesome witnesses for them. And really, uh, these are the kind of cases that we need to, to hammer home to people that the UFO phenomenon is a real thing and something that 
needs to be taken seriously. So I hats off to you for your work, and, and thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you very much. There you have it, folks. That does it for this week's edition of Been All of America Audio. Big, big thanks to Robert Hastings for coming on the show. As we noted at the beginning, Robert does not have a website, but if you go to the page where you found this interview, there's links to three great articles written by Robert, so you can find out more information on his research. Moving right along now, it's time for Been All of America Audio listener feedback, and this week's letter comes from Rick H., no hometown listed. Here's what Rick has to say. Tim, first I must say that you have the best show out there on internet land when it comes to the whole ufology thing. I listen to your show as often as I can. Anyway, what I am emailing you about is a suggestion for a guest on your show. His name is Gian Kassar. He is an acclaimed explorer and author and has been studying the Bermuda Triangle for over 20-some years or more. The Bermuda Triangle has sparked my interest for years. The mystery of all these lost ships and planes gone forever, along with the forgotten families and friends, is possibly the greatest phenomenon mankind has ever faced on this planet. Gian covers the complete history of the Triangle, missing aircrafts and ships, theories behind the Triangle, myths and facts, etc., His book, Into the Bermuda Triangle, covers all this and so much more. So I hope you check out all this info. I believe it would be a number one show on your site. Up there with the Skinwalker Ranch show you did some time ago. Thank you, Rick H. No hometown listed. No, Rick, thank you for the fine correspondence, the props. I appreciate them so much, and the guest suggestion. I actually emailed Rick back earlier after I first received the email, but I'll spill the beans to you folks, too. We only have two episodes left of Been All of America Audio Season 2, so at this point, we're not really looking to book any new guests until the fall season rolls around and we start planning for Season 3. But I will add Gian Kassar's name to the list. He's someone who I have considered having on Been All of America Audio for quite some time. Just haven't done the legwork, really, to get it all lined up. But for Season 3, I will put him high on the list. Which brings me to an additional point, folks. If you have guest suggestions, now's the best time to send them in because over the summer we'll begin planning Season 3. We'll begin setting it all up, making the necessary contacts, taping the first few interviews for Season 3. So if you have someone you want to hear on Vanilla of America Audio, send it in to us and we'll see what we can do about getting them on the show. Thank you again, Rick, for your kind words and the guest suggestion. Even if you don't have a guest suggestion, maybe you have a question, maybe you have a comment, maybe you just want to be a part of Benall of America audio listener feedback, there's a couple ways to do it. You either go to benallofamerica.com, click the contact button at the bottom of the left-hand side menu. You'll see it. It says contact. Click it. That'll bring you to the page with the contact information. Or simply write to boaaudio at hotmail.com, boaaudio at hotmail.com. Either one of those methods puts your correspondence on the road to BOA Audio listener feedback. Up next, we do it to it with the thanks to the fantastic BanalofAmerica.com staff, Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., and Tina Senna. They write fantastic columns at BanalofAmerica.com. We've got tons of great stuff in the pipeline coming to you, as we say, every week. Don't just listen to the audio show. Check out the columns. Otherwise, you're only getting half the story. And feel free to make BenallOfAmerica.com a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. Now comes the time in the show when I ask you for donations. I can't stress it enough, folks. We need donations. We need donations to pay for the phone calls. We need donations to pay for the bandwidth. We need donations to pay for just a host of stuff that you wouldn't even believe. We need the donations from longtime listeners or appreciative newcomers. You've stumbled upon Banal America Audio. You love it, and you want to know how you can help keep the show going and growing. And there's a way to do that. You go to banalofamerica.com, you click the PayPal button, and you make a donation. No donation is too small, and they all go towards paying for banalofamerica.com and BOA Audio. Make a donation if you can. It would be hugely appreciated. Next week on the program, to be announced. I'm taping the episode on Tuesday. I actually had to reschedule the episode because, as you may have noticed by now, I'm losing my voice, and we were going to tape it when this affliction first started, when it was much worse than it is now. So we rescheduled the interview to this coming Tuesday. I'll be taping next week's episode on Tuesday, and on Wednesday we'll have a little announcement at VanillaAmerica.com 
regarding who the guest is, but I will tell you that it is a cryptozoology-themed episode, and we're going to be talking about the mysterious and nefarious Bigfoot from a very different perspective than you get from mainstream cryptozoology. So it's going to be a little fringe cryptozoology next week with the guest to be announced on Wednesday. And then, of course, next week's episode is the penultimate episode of Season 2, which means in two weeks we've got the big, huge blockbuster, Banal of America Audio, Season 2, Season Finale. This year's Season Finale guest is just amazing. This guy goes beyond a legend. He's a true icon, a first ballot Hall of Famer in the world of esoterica. Name and musical preview to be announced very, very soon. That, of course, is going to air at BanalofAmerica.com, June 30th, 2007. We're going to close out BOA Audio Season 2 with a huge bang, folks. You're going to love this episode. I've already listened to it a couple times, and it is amazing. There you have it. All that and more coming to BanalofAmerica.com very, very soon. Stay tuned, folks. And on that note, I'm going to close it out and try and get a little rest for my weary voice. Until you hear from me next week, thank you so much for listening. This is Tim Benall, signing off.